Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special edition of Launcher Live. I'm Gene Park with the Washington Post. Um, I think every uh, episode is a special edition uh, because we all, we've been having a, a, a really good run of guests uh, so far. This is only our third show. Uh, if you haven't heard of us, uh, we, well, number one, we're with the Washington Post. Um, and number two, we are launcher.gg on the internet. We are the Washington Post's fairly new video game section. And uh, in this time of stay at home, whatever, uh, we've been trying out live shows and we're gonna be uh, talking about uh, all kinds of different things. And um, I'm wearing my little Waluigi hat because um, we have a huge, huge guest today, first of all, um, Gary Witta. He is a screenwriter. Uh, he's been uh, the former editor-in-chief of PC Gamer. And uh, most recently, he is uh, now the host of his very own Animal Crossing talk show. And me and editor Mikhail Klimentov are actually sitting in his uh, green room right now on the Switch. Um, uh, so we're about to see his studio. It's going to be really, really exciting. Um, Mikhail, uh, how are you feeling uh, sitting in the green room right now? Uh, I was feeling great. You mentioned really big guests coming on, and frankly, I thought you were talking about me. A bit bummed uh, that that wasn't the case, but, you know, I think the experience of being in Gary's studio uh, will more than make up for it. Well, we're the guests now, so it's, 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 it's pretty incredible. It's kind of like a cross-pollination thing. And also joining us is uh, Mr. Mike Hume, uh, our top editor at Launcher. How are you, Mike? Pretty good. Thanks for uh, having me. Sorry. Uh, I, will, I will do my best to fill Elise's shoes, but my uh, Animal Crossing knowledge is probably like 1%, if that, of what Elise It's okay. The, Mike, we are both men who are wearing hats today. Um, the, there was an article in, uh, I think, GQ about, about why men aren't wearing hats in Zoom. Um, I only wear hats on Zoom because I didn't shower, but I'm here to tell the audience right now that I did shower today. So please don't worry. Breaking news. Um, yeah. <laughs> but first, before we get to Gary, uh, we're going to talk about uh, some news uh, uh, really quickly. Uh, most importantly, at the top, The Last of Us 2 trailer launched this morning. And then right, into, right after that, we're going to talk about my Mario rankings, where I rank every single Mario game. But, uh, you know, uh, The Last of Us 2, we're going to start talking real quick about The Last of Us 2. Uh, uh, if you don't know, uh, there was a huge, huge leak uh, last week probably one of the biggest content leaks in like entertainment history because it just basically showed like uh the ending uh possibly the ending uh, the whole all the story beats and everything um mikhail you haven't seen the spoilers um i have seen the spoilers uh mike you haven't seen any of it and, and, and so we're about to watch the trailer right now uh these are this not the spoilers right this is just the official trailer yeah this is the official trailer this is an uh, official uh, two-minute trailer and this is going to be an interesting experience because Mikhail, uh, for some reason, saw the trailer before before this, because uh, he thought that reaction videos are like 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 uh, uh, um, um, uh, you know just like uh, uh, displayed things. But no, this is this is going to be an honest, good good, yeah. good reaction from at least my, Mike and me. Yeah. You had one job, Mikhail. I mean, come on. Yeah. Listen, I on the topic of late shows, I know there's a lot of kind of fakery that goes on behind the scenes of like. The host comes on, he says like, oh, I loved reading my, my guest's new 700 page book over the last night. Loved all the characters, loved the plot details, all fabricated. I thought this was a similar deal, but uh, I guess we really wanted earnest reactions. Yeah, no, no, yeah that's what we were real. going for. Oof. All right, and all also right. for the chat real quick, uh, question of the day, if you had your own talk show, uh, which Mario character would you uh, invite? So uh, tickle that as we watch. This last of two trailer. This is my first time seeing this, even though I know all the spoilers. <laughs> so you know, just let's let's just see uh, how it goes. Uh, run the run the tape, guys. There you go. I know you wish things were different. I wish things were different. Really? But they ain't. Please stop! I'm leaving 
tomorrow. To do this smart, we'll be leaving Jackson vulnerable. So they just get to get away with this. How'd you find us? You can't stop this. I want what you want. But not at any cost. We could have killed you. <laughs> Maybe you should have. All right. Wow. All righty. That seems really cool. cheery and optimistic. Well, The Last of Us 1 was was an incredibly dark story. Um, I remember when I showed my little sister, who's a, a heavy, very heavy reader, uh, the ending for Last of Us 1, and she was like, that was darker than a Cormac McCarthy novel. That's dark. Yeah, <laughs> which is pretty dark. Um, so uh, my impression, extremely good trailer. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it really doesn't show a lot. Um, uh, I'm trying to get myself into the mindset of someone who doesn't know all the spoilers. Uh, and uh it's really exciting because if if i if i if i was someone who was looking forward to this and i played the last of us one like i really have to bring like what exactly they're they're doing here um mike did you play the last of us one i forget so, so it's actually my next game i got queued up uh behind me uh i'll probably play it tonight actually uh my problem is free time like i have very little time to experiment with long play single player games uh i tend to use my gaming time these days to socialize uh so i play a lot more multiplayer but uh after watching that trailer i'm probably gonna fire that bad boy up tonight. you should so so i highly recommend if anyone's interested in the last of us 2 and never played part one like you need to play part one um yeah. uh, especially knowing what happens in the game uh uh like like that it, it's you very much it's a continuation of, the, of that story um and the, those themes so definitely um having seen the spoilers now and now combined with that trailer how what percentage of the plot do you think you can piece together like without further spoiling it for us i can i can piece together the whole plot easily oh, with, with that wow. with, with that trailer which is incredible it's a very very vague trailer uh mm -hmm. uh so so it's very well told um but uh the, there's obviously empty spots there obviously empty spots there that we'll be able to fill in the game so All right. well wow. yeah mikhail what did you think you played the last of us one yeah uh I mean, to be totally transparent, I played bits and pieces, kind of trading off with my roommate once. Um, what I'll say is, you know, the stuff that you seem to like, the, the vagueness really doesn't land for me. It just reads as like shot after shot after shot of like ashen faced people being like, mm -hmm. I can't believe this is happening. <laughs> uh, wow, point, that was really good. At, at a certain point, like that stops registering yeah. uh in a profound way so i'm kind of neutral on that but eh. sure sure i get that i think you have to really uh, uh uh connect with the characters to to really like understand like the like i guess really understand the emotion that, that they're going through yeah. um so uh yeah last of us two coming out may uh late may um try not to watch spoilers <laughs> um hopefully well i, I would have forgotten by then but uh, good luck, Naughty Dog. Um, I can't wait to actually fill out the rest of, of the story um, because uh, even if even if I did expose myself uh, uh, to spoilers, uh, really, if you just told, my, told me what happened in Last of Us 1, I'd be like, okay, and then I would play the game and I'd be like, well, that was a really compelling story because of, of how it's told. So the story beats are not as important as what, what's being told. And, you know, the trailer is, is really a, a great marker of that, like um, the, the cinematics and, and the drama that they show. Um, okay, real quick, uh, we're going to move into Mario rankings. Uh, I spent the last two weeks playing almost every Mario game. 
um, except for the ones on Game Boy, uh, but I did have the ones with 3DS. There were 19 core Mario games. Uh, out of over 200 um, Mario-related games on Mario Kart or Mario Tennis, these are the Mario games that make you jump from left to right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list uh, my top five uh, for people who didn't read and uh, my bottom five. So my top, top five are number one, Super Mario Galaxy. Number two, Super Mario World. Number three, Super Mario 64. Number four, Super Mario Brothers 3. And number five, the original Super Mario Brothers 1. And the bottom five uh, are, uh, we count from backwards, uh, new Super Mario Brothers for the DS, um, Super Mario Land 2, the six golden coins for the Game Boy, Super Mario 3D Land for the 3DS, uh, new Super Mario Brothers 2, I think I'm listing six, but whatever, uh, Super Mario Land for the Game Boy, and Super Mario Run for the iPhone. Um, so far, a lot of people are reading it, and uh, I'm actually pleasantly surprised at uh, the reaction, uh, at least to the top five. But I'm yep. interesting. I'm now starting to see an uh, interesting conversation bubble up about how I can rank games lower than others in the bottom half of the game. Um, uh, guys, uh, wait, wait, what's your impression? Mikhail, you had some, uh, some strong thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we get into the perils of like putting together a list like this. And just to clarify up top, like when you put this together, what was your process? Like what was the, the research that went into it if there was any? Yeah, yeah. It was basically, uh, so I, I listed at the top, uh, how has the game aged, uh, especially considering, you know, like games like Super Mario Bros. 3 are still like really extremely fun to play. Uh, what was the game's impact? Uh, I want to be able to uh, talk about legacy because, you know, like even though New Super Mario Bros. Uh, is, is, has like the Tanuki suit and everything else, like it's not as, in, as influential uh, um, as, as certain other games. And overall design and structure. Um, Mario games uh, are really, really meticulously designed to introduce the challenge. Like in, in, like in the very first Mario game, you see a little Goomba walking by and then there's a block overhead and you're meant to press one of the two buttons, jump. So you either die or you jump over it and then you hit the block and then you realize like, oh, I'm supposed to be jumping over things. I, the block might like hit me in the head and like me, me smash the, the mushroom down. So now I completely understand uh, the, what the parameters of what a Mario game is it, within the first few seconds of playing the very first Mario game. So yeah. that design principle is where, where I try to, to, to really look at uh, throughout the rest of the Mario games. Yeah, I think those having those criteria up front is just like valuable for people who orient themselves as readers. And naturally, I think a lot of people are just going to skip to what's number one. Yeah. But like... When I saw the list, my immediate reaction was like, oh, why didn't the, the DS title, uh, and I'm blanking on the name right now. New Super uh, Mario Brothers. New Super Mario Brothers. Why isn't that higher? And I think that's because my immediate instinct was like, it's sort of like when you listen to a new band that, or, or a band that you really like. And usually mm -hmm. the first album you listen to theirs has like a special place in your heart. Yeah. That DS title has that like special place in my heart. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of, feeling pretty aggro about it. Uh, and so having those somewhat objective criteria and as much as you can be objective putting together a list like this, I think that smooths over some of those debates you could have. Like I would put yeah. that title higher. Objectively speaking, it probably doesn't deserve to be quite as high as I would put it. Yeah, Mike, what do you think? Yeah, so I, I think I, I totally vibe with what Miguel is saying because my first reaction was like, oh, Super Mario Brothers 3, hands down, which is like mm -hmm. no, no contest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I think the, the criteria you said definitely sort of neutralizes some of the, uh, the defensive arguments you can get back at you. But I will counter with this because we're talking about social relevance too. You remember The Wizard? Super Mario mm -hmm. 3 was like the first game that they like teased in a movie before it was even available in North America. Mm -hmm. And that really stuck with me. And like getting back to my personal story, Super Mario 3 was like the first game I got like at the front end of the cool cycle. Like mm -hmm. I never got any toys or anything like mm -hmm. that. It's like I'm the first uh, one to have an iPhone or first one to wear a pair of Jordans or something like yeah, that. I was yeah. always like in the well-loved category by the time I got that. Mario, Mario 3 was your first pair of Jordans. It yeah. was exactly. It yeah. was that, but that's, that's an awesome way to put it. 
I know exactly where I was standing in my house when my parents gave it to me. Like, I know exactly like how fast I put it in the machine. Like it was a phenomenal experience. So I actually, yeah. because of how much I love that, and now I see you have four different Mario titles ahead of that. Yeah. Now I want to go play those four. Uh, I might have to break out my Wii to get uh, uh, Super Mario Galaxy back out. So Yeah, we have a comment from the chat. Zeph Davis, I love Three Lane Land. To me, it felt like a great middle ground between a sprawling open game like 64 or Odyssey and the more straightforward side-scrollers. I completely agree. Um, and if anything, like like the, 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 I'm probably getting the most crap from for uh, 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 ranking the 3D Land and 3D World games so low because they were phenomenal games. Uh, they're, they're all phenomenal games. It's hard. It's it's just really hard to to rank this. So, so I actually have a question about ranking and like what people want to get out of lists like this. Mm -hmm. I think when I don't want to put words in your mouth, it seems like when you were putting this together, you wanted a definitive ranking. Like the most people will agree with this list. Mm -hmm. Is there also a case for making a list like this where it's like? it prioritizes games that like didn't get their time in the sun. I know Polygon's list had a Wii U title at the top and that like mm -hmm. baffled people, but it's mm -hmm. also a case, I think for a small percentage of players to go, okay, what did I miss about this title? Should I revisit this? Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a case for making a list like that? Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, you know, <clears throat> uh, I think, well, Mike missed like Super Mario Galaxy, you know, and yeah. uh, you know uh, the Wii was very popular, so I so you know I feel like a lot of Mario fans didn't miss on that one, but uh, you know it's which is why like I try to 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 generously describe like a lot of the lower ranking games because a lot of the people did miss them. They might have missed Super Mario 3D World, which is gonna get a re-release, and that's that was actually the impetus of this list because yeah. of the rumors that that a lot of these games were gonna be re-released on the Switch which is an incredible, incredible opportunity for, for many people to revisit these games and really see what they miss. If they missed out on 3D World because uh, uh, a lot of people didn't buy the Wii U, as far as I know, it only sold about 13 million, under 20 million uh, um, units. Um, this is a great chance for people to finally get into 3D World because it really is a great mix of Mario 3 and Mario 64 together. Um, it's just not as good as Mario Galaxy, you know? That's the thing. Yeah. No, I, for my part, I just think it's cool that I have a job where I can assign somebody to go play every Mario game, and that's work. Uh, so really good job with the list, Gene. I've enjoyed it. Thanks. It was, it was a lot of fun to put together. Mario games, um, you know, as Mikhail kind of pointed out, like, like this is just fraught with, like, emotions and, and like, personal history, you know? Um, so uh, it's it's nice to be able to, to, to kind of tap into my own memories of it and try to, like, universalize that for other people. Um, so enough with Mario rankings. Uh, <laughs> we have a very special guest. Mike, we're going to say uh, uh, aloha to you for a bit uh, as we uh, switch over to Mr. Gary Witta and his animal talking talk show that we are sitting, currently sitting in the, in the green room. Um, and so me and Mikhail are just hopping out of our chairs right now. Uh, let's see. Oh, there you go. There you go. Hold on. Press on. All righty. Mr. Witter. Hello. Hello. Hey. hey. It starts me off on mute by default for some reason. I had to unmute it. Hello there. Hello, all. Let me uh, type this in. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi there. Hi there. I'm very, very wow. excited to uh, have you here, as you can see. Thank you so much for having us here, Gary. So, um, tell us about where we're at right now. Uh, right now, you are on the beautiful yeah, sunkissed. This is very exciting. Right now, you are on the beautiful sunkissed island of Kauai, which is uh, my island, uh, virtual island in the uh, world of Animal Crossing: New Horizons. And that right now, you're actually in uh, the study of my house. I'm a, a writer by trade in the real world, so I wanted to have a room that looked like a nice writer's retreat. I got my desk, my typewriter, my storyboards, my you know rejected drafts. Uh, my director's chair. Oh, like, the rejected drafts right here. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Many, many, many rejected drafts. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this is this is usually where I, I come and reflect. Uh, but I also, uh, now that I'm doing this crazy talk show, this this room also doubles uh, as a green room. Uh, and it is actually green, unlike most green rooms. Uh, but mm -hmm. we don't have any food or anything. I think one of the things I'm going to have to do is figure out a way to get out to a table with some uh, with some snacks and drinks and things for guests while they're waiting to come onto the show. 
uh like that like that sushi platter that, that, that's been floating around and everything that would be that would be great yeah I'm, I'm on the lookout for those kind of items right now okay <laughs> wonderful all right you want to take us around your house absolutely um so um i mean do you want to see the whole house or do you just want to see the parts that are relevant to the show oh well yeah the parts relevant to the show okay so um when guests come to uh, the show, uh, they, they kind of hang out in the green room mm -hmm. um, uh, and they're able to listen to the show via live audio so they can mm -hmm. kind of monitor the show. Just like being on a real talk show, you know, they pipe the audio from the live show into the green room or they have it on a monitor so that the guests can watch it while they're waiting to come on stage. Mm -hmm. We're able to do that here via Discord. Uh, we use the Discord chat app. We have a private a uh, high bitrate audio channel that all our guests um, uh, stay in. And that's how we talk together. And mm -hmm. what happens is our guests will come and stand here. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say, and now it's time for my next guest, uh, whoever it may be. Um, uh, and I'll introduce them and say, please welcome to the show, my next guest. And uh, as I announce their name, uh, mm -hmm. they head right down here and you should follow me. All right, Mikhail, should we go? Let's go. If people don't notice, I'm actually doing the the, uh, the uh, journalist head nod of just going mm hmm mm hmm like that. So, <laughs> as Gary and talks. Uh, they come on yeah. down, they come down here onto the set in my um, much like Wayne's World. Yeah, we built the set in our basement, and this wow. is where we broadcast from. Beautiful. It's set. a beautiful okay. set. I, I love. Thank what you. You've we done put a lot that. of work. In fact, I would say when I say we, I really mean not just me and my wife and my friend Adam Nickerson who. Um, uh, help put this who work on the show together, but also the community. When they saw that we what we were doing, uh, I started getting mm -hmm. items in the mail from my friends in the Animal Crossing community saying, "Oh, you know, I found a a fern or a drum kit or a TV camera that, that would look look great on the set." And so we kind of crowdsourced uh, this set. And what you're seeing on the set right now is pretty much how it normally is, except this second couch that you see over this red couch uh, mm -hmm. usually wouldn't be there. Um, it's only there because tonight, for the first time, we actually have four guests on the show. Uh, and uh, we need to be able to see. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Bring in a second couch. Four guests. Wow. I know, right? It's a, it's <laughs> absolutely it's absolutely amazing. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we wanted we wanted to be able to make sure that everyone could sit down. And so that that's this is just, second couch comes in just when we have um, a really packed show. Usually on a real talk show, and I yeah, you know, I, I got to say this is a real talk show, but on a live action you know TV talk show. Uh, you would have just mm -hmm. a longer couch that can, that can accommodate more guests. The best couch that we could find in Animal Crossing that fits the yeah. set only seats two. So if we need to seat more than two people, uh, we need to seat them uh, on the um, on the red couch here. And mm. so who are your so what, uh, four, four other guests tonight, first of all? Well, so tonight on the show, we have uh, YouTube uh, pioneer I Justine will be on oh. the show. One of the original YouTube legends, still very, very popular, more than 6 million followers wow. on YouTube. One of, the, one of the pioneers of YouTube, of live streaming, of Twitch. Um, and she has a, a huge channel on YouTube where she talks about tech, tech, travel and food and that kind of stuff. She's going to come on the show, probably our biggest guest yet. And uh, I'm hoping to get some tips uh, from her about how to, how to kind of grow this show and not completely blow it uh, as, we, uh, as we hear on the, on the cusp of, of stardom. We have Mike Krahulik and uh, Jerry Holkins from Penny Arcade, who, of course, created uh, PAX, Penny Arcade Expo, the biggest and best video game show out there. Uh, the video, oh, video my game God. Convention. They're going to be on the show. And, um, and Joey Noel from Kind of Funny Games will be on the show as well. So we got a, we got a busy, busy show tonight. That is a star-studded cast. Wow. I just seen, uh, I've been a fan of her for a long time. Penny Arcade even longer. Uh, kind of Funny Games is fantastic. That is, that, that is quite a list on one night. How? I know this is our biggest show yet. Like I said, that's why we had to bring in the second couch. Uh, and we've had big guests. You know, we had um, uh, uh, we've had we've had musical acts on the show. We had uh, actress Felicia Day was on the show. You know, from Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Supernatural and the Guild. Yeah. She came on and was hilarious. And we've got even bigger guests uh, lined up as well. But I'm not ready to reveal who they are yet. We always reveal who the next show's guests are during the current show. So if you watch tonight. Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Pacific at twitch.tv slash Gary Witter. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll be in for a great show, but you'll also find out who's going to be on Friday's show. Yeah. Excellent, so excellent. speaking of, we've, we've you know, talked about the guests, but we've almost jumped the gun. Uh, what kind of show is this? What are you going to be talking to them about? What's the idea here? As you can, can see from, as, so we... as you can see, yeah, by all means, uh, feel free to sit down. Um, Mikhail, you need to kind of sit at the I edge can't. of the, in I order can't. to both sit on the same couch, yeah, you both need to kind of walk. The trick, okay, so whoever's sitting on a couch needs to get up. 
Mikhail, get off. Okay, and now try and basically walk into the arm of the couch, and that will seat you at the on the edge, and you'll both be able. There Beautiful. you go. We we're learning learning how to do it around here. Um, yeah. I'm gonna go sit behind the desk. This is where I'm comfortable behind the host desk. Um, there you go. Look, I mean, as you, as you can see from the from the, uh, I'll give you kind of the god's eye view here. As you can see from the way the set is decorated, uh, the whole set and really everything we're doing here is kind of a love letter to classic American late night talk shows. You know, I, mm-hmm. I, I'm a Brit, so I didn't really grow up with these shows. But in the 24 years that I've lived here, you know, with uh, uh, watching Leno and Conan and Letterman and all, the, and all the talk show hosts and the current generation that we have now, you know, Kimmel and Fallon and Stephen Colbert uh, and still mm-hmm. Conan, apparently. Um, we... Uh, we, I, I, it kind of became apparent to me that the American late night talk shows are just kind of part of the American pop cultural fabric. Like everybody knows them. Everyone knows the format. The host comes out. It's been like, it's been this way since the 1950s and 60s. You know, the host comes out, does, does a little monologue, brings on a celebrity guest, does an interview. Maybe there's some stand up comedy. Maybe there's a musical act. It's light entertainment. It's the kind of thing that you watch to kind of turn your brain off at the end of a, of a hard day at work. And this is then this set and this show is kind of a tribute to that. We do exactly the same format. I come out, there's big band theme music. uh, There's opening titles. I do a little monologue with my band leader, Adam. He sits over here by the, uh, he's in the band area. Uh, Yes, feel free to play play with the drums. Um, Yeah, it's like Mi mi casa es su casa. And Mm -hmm. uh, it's, we have a lot of fun over here. So we have celebrity guests, we have musical acts, we have stand up comedy, we show clips, we do comedy bits. It's, if you've seen The Tonight Show, if you've seen, uh, Letterman, you've seen this show. It's very much in that classic uh, tradition. You even got the, the 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 ferns here too, which is incredible. We are there's a, there's a lot of tributes to the set here. Like, I'll give you an example. <laughs> For example, over here, um, the golf bag over here that we have. That's a tribute to Johnny, the great Johnny Carson, the greatest oh talk God. show host of all time. Uh, he loved to play golf, and you might remember when he used to do a joke uh, as part of his monologue. If it was a funny joke and people laughed, he would kind of mime doing a little golf swing like he hit it out of the park so the golf yeah. clubs back there are kind of a tribute to johnny the greenery back here uh is you know obviously all talk shows kind of have that but my favorite show of all time is the larry sanders show and if you remember on that show oh. the producer arty who pl- played by rip torn um was a, a real stickler for detail and he loved his greenery his ferns and his plants and he lovingly attended uh, to them and if anyone moved them even one inch he knew it's like who moved my plants and so the plants back there are kind of a tribute to Artie and the Larry Sanders show. And yes, you will notice that we are literally between two ferns. Wow. I, I, I've got to ask, it, it feels a bit like you're almost living the, the nerd stream. And I don't mean that derisively. You went from editor to screenwriter. Now you've jumped to talk show host, which feels you know, totally different and more forward facing. This is kind of a, a, a Proustian question, a Proust questionnaire type of thing but are you an ambitious person do you like the spotlight is this a natural extension of your personality i i mean i i'm i'm ambitious in my actual professional life uh you know my my life as a, as a screenwriter and a producer and as an author and i write comic books and my act this isn't my job this is like my day job uh, this is my day job my day job is i write movies and television shows and films and comic books and uh things like that and novels and yeah it's all very nerdy i mean i i, I grew up watching star wars and star trek and all of the stuff that i write whether it's Rogue One or the Book of Eli or Star Wars Rebels or Walking Dead, it's all, you know, very much in the nerd uh, world. And that's, that's what I like to do. Um, so I'm ambitious there. You know, I want to have a good career. But this, I don't quite know what to make of it. This is just a thing that I started as a hobby, just goofing around on the weekend last Saturday. And this show didn't exist like 10 days ago. And now it's a whole thing. Uh, we were just kind of playing around uh, in the basement of my house, kind of you know, playing dress up and playing talk show. And somehow um, it's now actually become an actual talk show with 12,000 viewers on Twitch and real celebrity guests and theme music and production hassles. And, you know, we do this as professionally as we can. And it's really weird, but like, you know, I, I've said it a number of times now, there is functionally no difference between what we do here and what Jimmy Fallon does on The Tonight Show, except we have no budget. And in fact, Jimmy and all the other talk show hosts have been kind of brought down to our level uh, by the coronavirus. You know, I'm doing my show from the basement and so is Jimmy. And so That's is Conan. They're all, they're That's all, they're extremely all, true. Everyone's shows right now are thrown together on shoestring uh, and duct tape. So um, it's it's been really fun to do. It's been a big headache, 
uh, in many ways, but solving a lot of the technical issues and challenges to get the show working and make it actually look and sound good and to, and to get the kind of guests onto the show that I want has been challenging, but also a lot of fun. Uh, there's also been a lot, of, a lot of hassle that I don't want. Like we're being approached now by corporate sponsors and you know I'm telling them all to go away. I, I, on, I honestly don't want their money. This is not mm -hmm. something that's intended to make money. It never was. It's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be a hobby. Uh, it's supposed to be something that would that would put a few smi some smiles on people's faces at a time when they really needed one. And people seem to have responded to that. People like that it's cute and whimsical and silly. And Animal Crossing was already kind of having a bit of a cultural moment before we came along. We've just, I think, kind of added to that and helped show like all of the amazing things uh, that are, are possible within the world of Animal Crossing. Like it's not just what we're doing. You know, people are staging music concerts. They're getting married. They're doing all kinds of amazing things inside the world of Animal Crossing, this is just another idea that seems to have taken off. And I've got no idea if this show is gonna continue. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll get bored of it. Maybe the audience will get bored of it. We're doing shows all through the month of May. We'll reevaluate after that. Uh, but I have no interest at all, none, in corporatizing or commercializing or monetizing or sponsoring this show. I, you know, This is never gonna be, uh, and don't get me wrong, I like cornflakes, but this is never going to be like animal talking brought to you by Kellogg's cornflakes. Because I think as soon as you do that, <laughs> it's going to feel like we've sold out. Like we just want this to be fun and silly and authentic. And uh, you know, if we make a if, you, if we make a little bit of money off Twitch or YouTube just from putting the show online, then great. But I'm not. The, the, I'm. You will. I, I'll make you this promise right now. Uh, you'll never see a corporate sponsor on this show. Here, here's us uh, showing our appreciation for that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Definitely appreciate yeah, we're it. We're going to hold you to that. <laughs> yeah. As you can see, I've given um, it a lot of thought. I'm like this all the time, thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, real quick, you mentioned earlier some challenges. Can, can you regale us of any um, specific uh, uh, technological challenges or limitations that you've had uh, to create this game? I mean, uh, there's... You mentioned you there's, mentioned there's, earlier there's, about about the whole dodo code thing too, but like there's I want different to there's different le there's different levels of it. And just in the last ten days that we've been been doing the show, we've we've gotten kind of good at anticipating all the technical challenges and working around them. Uh, we actually now send uh, our guests on the show a whole packet of information, very detailed information about exactly what is required for them to come on the show. Uh, like when you came on the show, I asked you to go into your Nintendo Switch settings and make some changes that were necessary uh, to be on the show. Our guests have to do that. They have to have a Discord account because that's how we connect to you via voice. We have access to a private high bitrate audio channel where we get really good audio. Our musical performers also use that uh, audio channel. Um, let's see what else. I mean, there are so many things. You know, Animal Crossing is amazing in many ways, and it's un un enabled us to build this beautiful set. But it's also very, very restrictive. Uh, there was many like once I have people on once I have people on the island, I can't move the set. Like I, I cannot move that couch right now. Like the set is locked when anytime that we're in an online game session. So I have to make sure the set is exactly what we need it to be before anyone uh, comes over. Uh, that's one issue. I'll give you another example of like something kind of silly, but like we have this um, area over here. We had a musical guest on the show on Wednesday night. Her name's Raquel Lilly. And she's, mm -hmm. she's a wonderful singer songwriter. And she actually performed two of her songs uh, live on the show. Uh, now the problem is usually on a late night talk show, when uh, a musical artist is before, and also we turn the lights down and we, we have the spotlight on them right here. Beautiful. So they look very, it's very, very dramatic lighting. Yeah. Um, and we love that. Look at that it, lighting. It's beautiful. I know. It's so cool. Our faces. Now the, yeah. the problem is usually I would be sitting behind my desk, but the character, the camera in the game pivots around me. You know, you're, oh. I'm the central point around which the camera pivots. Mm -hmm. And if I stay at my desk, I can't see the microphone properly, mm -hmm. right? So what I have to do is, in order to get an angle on the ca uh, angle on the on the guest, I actually come and stand here and lurk, kind of behind this fern here, and angle the camera in such a way that between the fern and the light, you don't see me, but you see the performer. So I'm not, you can't really see me right now, but I'm actually kind of lurking in a rather sinister way uh, behind <laughs> the, fern the whole time that the um, the whole time that the artist. Uh, is performing, and we like you know, lots of little tricks and workarounds uh, that we've been finding in order to to um, uh, deal with those those technical challenges. And honestly, that, that's been a big part of the fun. Is you know how you know, here, here is a set of restrictions. Uh, here are the things you can or cannot do. Figure it out, and uh, we've been figuring it out, and it's been great so far. That's incredible. That's so it's a very little bit of machinima going on there. 
our our visuals guy behind the scenes is messaging us that he's just fascinated, blown away by this. He's in love. So thank you for sharing that detail. The other thing that we're doing that I'm very proud of, and I must share this with you, is um, the, the this this started as a way to hang out with my friends playing Animal Crossing. You know, in in a way that was fun and cool. Uh, but now we have people that want to come on the show who are excited about being on the show. They want to be part of uh, Animal Talking, but they don't have Animal Crossing and they can't get it because as you know, it's really hard to get a Nintendo Switch right now. You can maybe get a Switch Lite, but an actual like full on Nintendo Switch, practically impossible to find. Uh, and Raquel Lilly, who was the musician we had perform on Wednesday night, really wanted to perform and I really wanted it to, but she didn't have Animal Crossing. So we came up with what I think is a rather ingenious solution. What happens is now my wife, Leah, who also plays the game and is actually an executive producer on the show, takes her own character and basically gives it plastic surgery inside the game, modifies it to look like whoever we want it to look like. And so we Leah took her character and basically transformed it into Raquel Lilly, who's a different ethnicity, has a different skin color, a different look. And we also, we, we even allowed um, Raquel to pick her own wardrobe. We said, what do you want to wear? She said, I want to wear a floral dress with purple sneakers. We went into our wardrobe department. Basically we clear out Able Sisters every day. We buy everything in the store. Uh, and, and we were able to put Raquel in a floral dress with purple sneakers. And she signed off on the look. She knew exactly what her character would look like before it came on the show. Um, and, it, and, and it was wonderful. And she performed live. And people thought that we were doing a pre-recorded track, but you could actually go to Raquel's own Twitch channel live at the same time and see her performing it live in the studio. So there's no trickery. If I, if I say it's live, it's live. Um, we're doing live music and we have a lot of live music coming up. Uh, on the show and at the end of the show when Raquel came over at the end of her performance she came and sat on the couch and did a little interview it's it's Raquel's like it's really Raquel talking she's coming in from her studio and I was I kind of went back and forth and like I don't know should I as the magician reveal my my tricks here um mm -hmm. and but at the end I said look I, I, I'm going to show you how there's a little little surprise here uh this is obviously the real Raquel Lily talking right now but that's not her sitting on the couch that's my wife who look, who's just been made to look like Raquel. She's wearing a Raquel Lily disguise and everybody just freaked out. Like we had like David Copperfield had just made the Statue of Liberty disappear. It was a really, really cool uh, <laughs> trick. And we're now using it going forward. We actually have, we have a couple of guests on the show Friday uh, who were excited, but neither of them have Animal Crossing. And so both of them are going to be given their own, we're going to build their own custom virtual avatars that they will. One of the guests uh, requested a tuxedo. We found them a tuxedo. Um, and we will control them. The, the, the Leah's technical term on the show is avatar puppeteer. So there's two elements now. You either bring your own character onto the show and control it yourself and provide the voice, or you can just provide the voice and uh, someone over here, likely Leah or maybe someone else, if we need to do multiple uh, avatars, will control the character for you from this end. That's exactly what I was going to say. It's puppeteering. It's, 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 it's hologram work. It's, it's incredible. It's a little, I often say, you know, I work in Hollywood and I often say that uh, Hollywood movies um, are the closest thing we have in the world to actual magic. And I feel like we're doing a little bit of magic here on the show. <laughs> Thank you actually for that incredibly, incredibly useful transition because we, we do want to talk a little bit about your, uh, your past work in Hollywood. Um, uh, the, the, could, could you talk a little? Could, could you talk a little bit about your CV and and what you've done? Absolutely. Before? So yeah. I started as a video. And part of the reason why I love this game is uh, I, I I've always I've loved games my entire life. Ever since I was a kid, I grew up in the eight bit era of video games. I've been a video game nerd uh, my entire life, and uh, mm -hmm. that was actually my first career. I was a game journalist. I was editor in chief of a magazine called PC Gamer, which is still around today. First mm -hmm. in the UK, where we originally created it, and then when we uh, launched a U.S. edition. I came over to the U.S. to help uh, launch the American edition of the magazine. And it was just supposed to be a, be like my one year in America to get the magazine up on its feet. But I ended up falling in love with California and the Bay Area where I still live and decided to stick around. And I've also also loved movies. I'm a big movie nerd, a big sci-fi nerd. And I never really thought about pursuing that career professionally until the year I was very happy in the job that I had. I, was, I had a dream job. I was, you know, I ran a video games magazine. I got to play video games all day and hang out with cool people in the video game business. And then around, but then around 2000, when the dot com crash happened, um, I got um, I got laid off and I was completely uh, heartbroken, as you can see. My little character there feeling very sad about it. Um, he's still, he's, <laughs> this cracks me up, this little guy. I love it. Um, <laughs> 
and uh, I thought it was an opportunity to maybe try something different. I'd been made redundant. I had enough money um, saved up to live very frugally for about a year if I just ate, you know, chunky soup and ramen noodles for a year. And I thought, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this other thing. And I started writing screenplays. And I wrote a bunch of screenplays, uh, each one, you know, kind of slightly less awful than the last until I had one that I felt was good enough to show to people. And I was able to get representation. And I wrote a bunch of movies that no one ever read. No one ever, you know, the, the scripts never got made. And then eventually I wrote a movie called The Book of Eli, which did get made. Um, and that's what kind of got me started off in the uh, film industry. And I've made two more feature films since then. I made a movie called uh, After Earth, which I co-wrote uh, by, uh, with M. Night Shyamalan, who also directed it, starring Will Smith. And uh, most recently, I was one of the writers, the co one of the co-writers of Rogue One, A Star Wars Story. And that's kind of the movie that, that made me kind of most visible, because obviously everybody is interested in Star Wars. And uh, that gave me a platform uh, to continue doing the work that I love doing. I'm still writing movies. I still work on TV shows. I worked on Star Wars Rebels, uh, the animated show. I make, I make, uh, I write novels. I write comic books. I kind of do all kinds of uh, nerdy stuff. And I guess now I, I started calling myself an accidental talk show host because, like, again, I, I stress none of this was meant to happen. It just, you know, maybe that's, you know, the the coolest thing about it is, you know, I work very, very hard in my in my day job to get people to pay attention to things that I'm working on, um, and yet the thing that people seem to be paying most attention to and enjoy the most is this thing that was a complete accident. Uh, and you know, it's, it's kind of cool. So speaking of accidents and things that didn't come together, I hope this isn't a sore subject. Um, you were, uh, working on mouse guard, uh, writing that and that kind of fell apart when Disney bought Fox. And I see you're queuing up the, the heartbreak emote, which is, so hard. So well, I actually, I actually just bumped the button. I didn't mean to do that, but yeah, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> that wasn't deliberate. Uh, fellows, let's get some heartbreak going in the chat. Uh, yeah. But my, this is kind of a, this is a boring editor question about Hollywood, but I'm curious how you feel about studio consolidation. The fact that, you know, Disney bought Fox, there's now what, six or five major Hollywood studios. Um, Curious what your what your feeling on that is. Um, you know, there's a lot of consolidation going on, but at the same time, there's also more buyers than ever. You know, Disney. Yes, Disney is is obviously the most powerful single entity in the business now. They own Fox and ESPN and and so many other things. Um, and I, you know, I I I've done a lot of work for Disney. I love Disney. We have Disney Plus in the house. My kid loves it. Um, but yeah, there are fewer and fewer studios. But at the same time, there's also now Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and Quibi and so many other things. I'm like forgetting like 20 of them. There are so many, there are actually, there are actually more buyers out there for material. Like I've actually got a, a project that I'm working on right now that we're, pre we're preparing to kind of go out and pitch. And there are like so many people that we can take it to because everyone is hungry. You know, HBO Max is a thing now, you know, and then, and they're all desperate for content. They have to fill up these, these content slots because these massive streaming wars are happening and everybody wants shows. Everybody wants movies. So uh, I, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever kind of consolidation has happened within the studio system, I think has been mitigated and then some by all these new uh, outlets that have emerged. So, you know, there's plenty of people out there uh, for me to try to flog my, my wares to. Uh, get, getting back to uh, uh, Star Wars for a bit, you know, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. I love Star Wars. Uh, Rogue One was, was interesting to me um, it, it, because it was so different. Uh, but I, I'm curious to hear to your thoughts uh, without revealing too much of what you might be involved with or what might not be involved with. Just hypothetically, if you were in charge of the Star Wars franchise, if you were the Kevin Feige of Star Wars, how would you? Uh, what would you do moving forward with the franchise? You know, I know that Disney has been talking a lot about like you know like getting rid of the trilogy structure. They got the Mandalorian, which was a fantastic, and these games and and other shows. Uh, Clone Wars just finished. Um, but uh, what would you do with, with all these different different types of storytelling mediums going on with Star Wars right now? Uh, you know, I have to be very, very careful anytime I talk about Star Wars, especially yeah. the future of Star Wars, because I can very easily get into trouble. I gave an interview when the Rogue One Blu-ray came out and somebody <laughs> said to me, like, what, you know, what, what do you think the future of the standalone movies will be? And I was like, I don't know. But like, I, as a fan, I, I, I'm no longer part of those conversations because I'm done. They don't tell me anything anymore now that I'm done with the movie. You know, mm -hmm. Lucasfilm is kind of like the CIA, very much a need-to-know basis on everything. Mm. 
Um, and that's because they're such a high currency in rumors. They have to be very protective about everything that they do. Mm -hmm. But I said to the journalist, like, if it were me, just as a fan, I would like them to do ba 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 ba. I can't remember what I said. But then the headline the next day was Gary Witter reveals the future of the standalone movies. And, oh my God. I, and I get in trouble for things like that. So uh, they have a rule at Lucasfilm. It's fine to talk about the things that have happened in the past. Like I can talk to you about Rogue One, but, we, but mm. we're not supposed to talk about things that are happening in the future. And I can't even talk to you about things that are happening in the future because I don't know what's happened. I, I know I now know as much as you do about when 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 Lucasfilm announces a new project, I learn about it mm -hmm. at the same time you do because I no longer work with them. I worked I worked with Lucasfilm mm -hmm. and with Disney in the Star Wars world for five years, and I was very mm -hmm. very you know, thrilled and honored to be there, and it was one of the greatest experiences of my life. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of I, I have to be, in terms of even what like my preference is, what I would like to see, what I would do in a in a what I'm just not going to say it because I, I I guarantee you you won't do it because you guys are proper journalists. But someone else will read this and turn it into a okay. clickbait article, and my phone's going to ring, <laughs> and I just don't need the aggravation. Other journalists watching this, please contextualize Gary's comments in full. The, <laughs> we've we've got a lot of there's there's a lot of commentary before and after what he just said. So we're just gonna leave it at that right now. So <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to give you any any heartburn, uh, but you did say you could talk about kind of things that came in the past. Uh, so I I do want to ask about reshoots. So today reshoots have this kind of currency as this cool would have been could have been thing, but there are also you know people and visions and feelings around them, and we know from reporting that Tony Gilroy, who directed some of the Rogue One reshoots, had a kind of a dim view of the movie when he came in. And Gareth Edwards, the, the credited director, has been out of the spotlight for a while. I'm curious where you fall on that and kind of what your view of that, that whole process was. I mean, I'll simply say this. Pretty much every big Hollywood movie goes through that process. You know, a movie is not finished until it's finished. You, you revise when you write the scripts. You know, scripts often spend months and months and sometimes years in development being rewritten over and over and over again. You revise when you shoot. You uh, shoot over and over again until you've got the, the footage that you want. You revise, of course, when you edit. You do multiple, multiple edits of a film. Sometimes after you get the edit, you realize you want to go back and, you know, when you see the film cut together, you know what, we, we, we and now seeing the full context of the film, we actually realize that we need to do a bit more of this or that or change that. You go back and you reshoot. And you keep tooling with the movie until it's done. And if you're George Lucas, you keep retooling the movie even years after it's done and re-releasing you know, re mm -hmm. special editions because, you know, true uh, perfectionists are never happy. Um, you know, if you, if you, if you talk to a uh, real artist, they'll ask you like, you know, when do you consider a piece of work finished? And they'll always say it's never finished. They're never, they're never happy with it. Um, yeah. So it happens on every big Hollywood movie. Uh, it's just more visible when it happens on Star Wars, because Star Wars has such cultural currency and, you know, people are more interested in the stuff that gets left on the cutting room floor on a Star Wars movie than the, than the footage that's actually used in every day in actual other films. It's crazy. Yeah. So when there were reshoots on Rogue One, it was very, very, you know, people were speculating and talking about it. I actually cannot speak to it. Um, in an informed way very much because I wasn't there. My, my job as a writer was done by the time they were doing reshoots. That's true. Uh, so, That's true. you know, I know a little bit about it, but not really that much more than has already been reported. Um, and I, and I, I would simply add this. Uh, a lot of people seem to think uh, that when a movie undergoes reshoots, that must mean the movie's in trouble. I don't necessarily agree with that. And I'll give you one example. The scene of Darth Vader in the hallway of the profundity at the end of the movie uh, which is a lot of people's favorite scene in the movie. And it's personally, I'm biased, obviously, but it's one of my favorite uh, top 10 scenes in all of Star Wars when Darth Vader is kind of just massacring those poor rebel soldiers in the hallway. Mm -hmm. Everyone loves that scene. It's a mm -hmm. classic, classic Star Wars scene. Mm -hmm. That was added in a, in a very late reshoot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the idea that reshoots must mean the movie is in trouble um, as opposed to simply, look, we're just doing everything we can to make the movie better, even if it means adding things very late in the process. Um, that is, that's the reality of it. And a lot of people who you find on the internet, these armchair movie experts saying, well, they're reshooting. It must mean this and that. They have no idea what they're talking about. I've been doing this for, I've been working in Hollywood for 20 years. Um, I, I, I when, when they reshoot a movie, I don't bat and I, I go, okay, that's part of the process. And it doesn't in any way, uh, make me think the movie is in trouble, but armchair movie experts who think they know what they're talking about and, and people that are looking to generate 
clickbait by by generating controversy controversy and drama where none exists um it will always take something like reshoots and turn it into a reason uh to to drive traffic to their site but oftentimes it's a big it's a big fuss about nothing gotcha yeah one of the things i was i was primarily wondering about and i think you you addressed it perfectly was kind of when you as a as a as a writer drop off the project because i'd been talking to some folks in the vfx industry for something i'm working on uh, and they get kind of change orders very late in the process. So for them, it's a lot of heartburn and strife when, when changes happen late in the game. But you totally addressed like, okay, if changes are happening late in the process, the writer's probably not touching that at a certain point. Sometimes, I mean, again, it really depends on the movie. Sometimes they are. Sometimes writers are, are, on, are on the set rewriting the movie day by day. It, dep- it depends on the movie. Every movie is different. Every movie has its own um particular issues and concerns every movie has you know different uh a different process but it's not uncommon it's completely at at the big kind of hollywood level and even at the indie movie level it's not uncommon to be tweaking and reshooting and changing things right up until the last i guarantee you every director uh that you are that you would talk to is not happy at the moment they have to lock the film and release it they would they would they will keep tinkering with it for weeks if they could but at some point you got to say okay this is the version we're releasing all right, Gary, thank you so much. I have one more question too. Gary, what color lightsaber would you have if you had to build your own? Yellow. Yellow? Wow. Yellow is my favorite color, and I feel like it's an unrepresented color in, in, uh, in terms of Star Wars lightsabers. That's mm. true. That's true. That, and that was a very exciting moment for in one of the movies. So. <laughs> is that the reason um, this couch is yellow? Is, uh, no, we actually, we actually have this couch in every uh, color available in the game. And we we swap it out from show to show just to keep the keep the show fresh. Gotcha. Right, you're you're just here on a day where the couch happens to be yellow. Oh, very <laughs> serendipitous. Yeah, we got a, co- a couple of comments from the chat. Um, <clears throat> someone asking, Kaiju Lex asking, uh, we need some harder hitting news on on the show, like just exactly what Timmy and Tommy are doing with all those fruits and bugs they've been buying, and where is Tortimer? I, you know, I've got, I, all I know is I like that Timmy and Tommy will buy almost anything from me. Like they'll, they'll <laughs> buy, they'll buy trash. They'll buy, you know, s- s- scraps. They'll buy weeds. They'll, they'll buy, these guys will buy anything. Um, That's true. Of, we, we need merchants like this in this time, in this day and age to, to, to be able to have a good, healthy barter and trade economy going. Right. I'm telling you that, that Nook family, they're very business savvy. Tom, Tom Nook built a business empire out of a tent. He's got his, he's got his own ATM, his own bank. He's, he's doing mortgages. Mm-hmm. uh you know it's it's and it's a, I li- and i like that it's a family business as well yeah yeah do you, you have another question is nintendo okay with this have you does it, is nintendo aware that you're doing this i mean i hope so i don't see any reason why they wouldn't be we've at, i'm actually talking right now i mean he no longer works at nintendo uh but we actually are in, in conversations right now with reggie fisa the uh, the former president and oh. coo of nintendo of america to come and be a guest on the show and he's really excited about it he, um, and I'm I asked to other him people. last week if he if I could visit his island, and he says not ready for public view yet. So maybe oh no, I'm sure I'm sure he's a, Reggie is a perfectionist in everything he does. Uh, so we're trying to work that out with his schedule. In terms of like how Nintendo would view this, first of all, I would just say I don't know what I'm I don't know what I'm doing that is quantitatively any different than what every other Animal Crossing streamer on Twitch and YouTube is doing. All I'm doing down here, I haven't modified or hacked. Or, 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 or change the game at all. Anyone could do this. I just did it before anyone else. You, every, again, item that, every item that I'm using in the game is an item that is available in the game. This is any, anyone could build this set. Anyone could put out a, a, an Animal Crossing talk show. And we're not, we're, not, we're not breaking the game. We're not doing anything outside of the, you know, Nintendo's uh, uh, EULA or anything like that. And, uh, you know, we're not doing anything other than any different than any other YouTuber or Twitch streamer. We're playing Animal Crossing. We just happen even, to be doing it in the context of a talk show. You're not even taking corporate sponsorship. So and, and, I, and, and I'm telling you, I won't, I'm not doing it. And, and also, it's a very clean show. It's a wholesome show. It's a family show. I tell people who come onto the show, just here's the rule. If you can't say it on The Tonight Show, you can't say it here. Mm-hmm. Just, you, just use that rule. I, I actually, I'm usually, I'm, I'm, I'm quite um, liberal with my use of colorful language, but on the show, <laughs> my talk show character is very well behaved and we try to keep that sort of thing uh, to a minimum. You know, we don't do politics. We don't, we try not to do anything controversial. Mm-hmm. It's light entertainment. It's, it's fun for all the family. And if anything, 
I would think that Nintendo would be thrilled because this is not, not that they need it, but this has generated a ton of po uh, positive press. I've seen all kinds of people saying, oh my God, this is so cool. I now want to go out and get in on this game now that I can see all the wonderful things you can do. Um, and it's put a lot of smiles on people's faces. Like if anything, how has this done anything other than, than, than show Animal Crossing in a wholesome and positive a creative light. So I would hope that Nintendo, um, if they take any view of this, um, think that it's that, that it's cool. Yeah, we hope so too. And, and we're hoping that Reggie get, uh, gets on your show too. Like, Mikhail, you got a question? Yeah, yeah. I, I have to ask, uh, just to peek behind the veil a tiny bit, Gene has spoken with Reggie. And Reggie, you mentioned, is a perfectionist. He's also a savvy businessman and is careful about what he says in public and to the press. If you could ask him any one question under the condition that he, he answers it candidly, fully, no holds barred, what would you ask Reggie? Um, I'm thinking about it very carefully right now. Um, you know what? I don't want to duck it, but I, 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 am gonna, I am gonna not answer that question and I'll tell you why. Because I think there's a good chance Reggie's gonna come on the show and, if I, and I'm gonna want to ask him that question. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Why, why, why blow it now? Why give it away now? No, yeah, we, we, got, we got a teaser for the show. So yeah. Well, so if you want to know really what Gary's question to Reggie would be, make sure you follow and subscribe uh, Gary, uh, to Gary's show and make sure that- uh, Absolutely. So you know uh, will be on the show, right? Twitch, I'll do, I'll do my little plug right now. Uh, Twitch.tv slash Gary Witter, G-A-R-Y-W-H-I-T-T-A. -T -T That's where you come to watch the show live. We do sh three shows a week, uh, Monday mornings at 9 a.m. Pacific. Wednesday nights, 7 p.m. Pacific. We have a big, big show tonight with uh, I, Justine, and the guys from Penny Arcade and, and Kind of Funny will be on the show. Um, and then we do a show again Friday morning, uh, 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific time as well. And then if you can't catch the show live, uh, all of the episodes are archived on my YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash G with a G-W-H-I-T-T-A. You can go and watch the show uh, on demand. All of the six episodes we've done so far are archived there. My other show, Animal Crossing Mornings, where I just play Animal Crossing, like, you know, the way you're actually supposed to, you know, picking up fruit and stuff. That's, I do that show every day. That's there as well. And, uh, and, and in addition to that, uh, where every episode, because the shows run about two hours long. So we just started now, every episode that we put up, we also put up a 10 minute highlight reel. So if you have a quibby length attention span, uh, you can just watch like the 10 minute quick hits from the show. You also, since we're on plugs, you're working on a, on a comic book project right now, right? Yeah, right now. Um, so I'm four issues in, myself and Derek Robertson, who co-created The Boys, which is a big hit on Amazon Prime right now. Um, we do a comic called uh, Oliver. Uh, and it's a steampunk uh, post-apocalyptic retelling of um, Oliver Twist that reimagines Oliver as a genetically engineered superhero. And I know that sounds ridiculous. Charles Dickens is rolling in his grave, but what's he going to do about it? It's, uh, Oliver Twist is in the public domain. Anyone can do what they want with it. And we've been having a blast. Um, it's really fun. We're four issues into a 12 issue run. And, uh, and I'll tell you, Image actually is doing a great thing right now because of the coronavirus, because everyone's stuck at home and they want stuff to, to watch and to read. Uh, you can go into Comixology right now and a bunch of Image comics are actually available either for, either for free or discounted to 99 cents. And Oliver right now, you can read the first issue, number one, uh, for, night, for, for free. And the other three issues are only 99 cents. So that's actually a great deal. I'm actually going to do that. That sounds like a fascinating. You got to check it out. It's stupid. really it fun. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It sounds really great. <laughs> so thank you so much, Gary. I have one last question for you. Uh, if you had your own talk show, which Super Mario character would you invite for an interview? I, excuse me. I, I thought we established I do have my own talk well, show. Well, I mean, like, if you if you were to invite an actual Mario character onto into Animal Crossing to talk to, you, if I okay, so if, so if I could get a, Ma a Mario character into my very real talk show, is that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> I would I would like I would like I might uh, hold on. I'm gonna I actually don't need to think about this because I know the answer, but I'm gonna pretend like I'm thinking about it. There okay. Um, my answer would be Luigi, mm. and I'll tell you why. Yeah. You know, it, the, the whole Mario sensation started years ago with a game called Mario Brothers. And Mario, it started as two brothers, you know, with a dream, Mario and Luigi. And over the years, one brother has completely overshadowed the other. 
you know, it's, 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 it's the Mario brothers. And I know that their names are Mario, Mario and Luigi Mario. So technically that's okay, but it's the Mario brothers and poor Luigi, who, by the way, I, I think he's a great guy. He can, he can jump higher than Mario. He's got a lot. The Mario, Luigi's got a lot to, a lot to offer. And yet he somehow uh, lives in the shadow of his brother. And I, if I could get like, if I could get like really, again, like really kind of like, you know, after dark, you know, up close and personal <laughs> with Luigi, uh, get a little intimate with him and get like the real scoop. I would ask him, uh, what is it like to enjoy incredible fame and incredible success, be one of the most recognizable video game characters on the planet, and yet at the same time know that you will always be in the shadow of your, of your bigger brother? He's like the Ringo of the Mario Brothers, I guess, right? No, I, well, I see. I, I, I don't know if that's the right analogy. Yeah. I, 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 here's the thing. Think of it more, think of the, think of it more like Lennon and McCartney, but like, but yeah. like no one thinks about John Lennon or no one thinks that they all, they all think it's more one than yeah. the other. Right. Like, mm. and, and I think that, and I, I, I think they're equally as important, but Mario, get, you know, Luigi does just as much work as, as Mario, but Mario gets all the glory. And um, well, I'm, I'm, you know, it's, it must be very, difficult for him emotionally. And I'd, I'd, lo I'd love to get to the bottom of that. I'm totally with you. I think Luigi always had, they, they always allow Luigi to have so much more personality than Mario does. And, and, and I have to wonder why that is too. So there's actually a moment. I mean, I, so I really like the, you know, they did, they did the year of Luigi a few years ago, but it wasn't that great. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, but Luigi's yeah, Mansion 3, <laughs> my favorite game of last year was actually Luigi's Mansion 3, which is a delightful game. And there's a moment at the end of Luigi's, Luigi, uh, Luigi's Mansion 3 where Luigi and Mario, spoiler alert, it's not really that big a spoiler, uh, Luigi and Mario are finally reunited. And it's such a sweet moment. And it really does show that those two guys um, you know, have, a lot of, have, a lot, have a lot of love for each other. And it's, it's a really cool game. Gary, and incredibly enough, I think you've written the, the perfect analogy for these characters, Krennic and Grand Moff Tarkin, the guy who is you know, equally important, but keeps getting all of his you know, achievements uh, swallowed up by his higher up. Yeah, that's, you know, that was a, that was also a very uh, awkward power dynamic as well. You know, again, Krennic did all the work and Tarkin was then like, oh, thanks. I'll just go take, I'll take this to the emperor and take all the credit for it. Uh, I can certainly understand why Krennic wasn't too, uh, too thrilled. Again, I guess, I guess the lesson is, you know, if you're going to mess with Grand Moff Tarkin, you know, just be aware of what you're getting into. <laughs> Krennic was such a great character. We have a we have a funny uh, comment from the chat. While Luigi is a Tyler Durden of Luigi, I don't know what that means, but it's it's very intriguing. Yeah, it's, it's, he's the the alternate per, uh, personality from uh, Oh Fight sure, Club, yeah, Fight Club. No, no, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, no, I know I know who Tyler Durden is. I just yeah. don't know what how how he how he is relevant uh, to yeah, what, yeah, what the yeah. Waluigi comparison is. Yeah, because Waluigi is very much a real person too. And he, he's real that's, and he's concrete. That's how, so. I, that's how I like to think about yeah. it. <laughs> well, Gary, thank you so much for your time, uh, taking time on your busy day. I know you have a huge show tonight. Again, I just seen the Penny Arcade Guys and Kind of Funny Games uh, tonight on Animal Talking with Gary Widow. Thank, thank you. Gary, thank you for having me. I'm a, a big fan of the Washington Post. I subscribe to it. I love what you're doing with Launcher. And it's a, a real thrill to be uh, on your show. That means a lot coming from you, Gary. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, so thank you Gary. Take care. Bye-bye.